It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. We all know that PSWs and nurses have been the frontline health care heroes throughout this pandemic, but they work in absolutely terrible conditions, conditions that none of us would want to be working in. Yesterday's announcement, frankly, neglected these heroes. The pandemic pay bump for PSWs expires at the end of this month. And so my question to the Premier is, why won't he say yes to a permanent pay increase for Ontario's PSWs, the heroes of this pandemic? To reply, the Premier. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And and I want to thank the opposition for the, that ridiculous question there because we've been there from day one for the PSWs. They voted no for four hours of extended care. They voted no to give them the bump of $3. And I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, that I've said from day one, the PSWs are under, overworked, underpaid, and we're going to make sure we make them whole. They're always going to have that bump. We will make it permanent. But I got to ask the opposition, Mr. Speaker, why every single thing we've done, no matter if it's increasing the ICU beds to 3,100 uh, beds, it, increasing the health budget by billions of dollars, it was no, no, no. Everything's no without a solution from the leader of the opposition. We're a party of yes. We're supporting the PSWs. We'll always have their backs. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, PSWs know very well who's been fighting for them all along, uh, but here we are again. Every few months, PSWs have to wait and see if this government will do the right thing. But this government has never done right by our PSWs. Let's not forget that they couldn't even access PPE at the beginning of this pandemic, in fact, well into it, and people who are PSWs actually lost their lives as a result of this government's negligence. The least that this pr uh, Premier could do is stop threatening that they will have their pay increase clawed back every couple of months, because that's what they're living with right now. Why is it so easy for this Premier to say yes to his buddies and no to permanent pay cr increases for PSWs? To reply, the Premier. Again, through you, Mr. Speaker, we invested $270 million yesterday. We're investing $4.9 billion that the opposition voted against. They voted against that four hours of care. They voted against, Mr. Speaker, 27,000 new PSWs and nurses. We're the first in the country, first in North America, to have four hours of care. We're, we're the first to go in there to make sure that the environment is a lot better by making sure the filtration systems are clear. We're putting air conditioning in in every single long-term care home across the, the country. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? It's no, no, no with the Leader of the Opposition. Do you know what the Leader of the Opposition does? She uses the PSWs a bunch of props. We care for the PSWs. That's the difference between the opposition Response. and our government, Mr. Speaker. The final supplementary. Uh, the truth is that, in fact, PSWs know it, family members know it, residents know it. This government has no intention of getting four hours uh, to four hours of hands-on care until 2026 or later. So let's be real about what's going on here. Recruitment and reten retention of these workers is not going to happen without PSWs workers knowing that the government actually has their backs. In fact, here is what the union representing the frontline workers. Uh, the frontline PSW say, and it's uh, SEIU Healthcare, and I quote, absent in today's, yesterday's announcement, is any action to improve the abhorrent conditions of work that still exist in Order. Ontario's long-term care homes, the time to stop protecting the greedy interests of the big nursing home chains who simply want more discretionary spending should have ended long ago. I agree wholeheartedly with the, these remarks. Speaker, question. The, pro, pro, the question to the pr, uh, Premier is when will he actually say yes to PSWs, give them that permanent pay raise instead of boosting profits for his buddies that run long-term care homes. To reply, the Minister of Long-Term Care. 
Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know why uh, the Leader of the Opposition won't take yes for an answer. I think the Premier was clear, but, but she wants to quote some union leaders, so let me do that for her. Uh, President, this is Jerry Dias, President of Unifor. You may have heard of him. Ministers, the Minister's announcement is a step in the right direction, helping long-term care workers provide residents with adequate care they deserve. This announcement moves us closer to achieving the minimum of four hours of care. That's from Naveen Rizi, the Regional Director of Unifor. We're encouraged. Now, this is Candace uh, Rennick. She's the Secretary-Treasurer of CUPE uh, in Ontario. You know them. We're encouraged to learn that this government is finally taking the necessary steps to enshrine four hours of care and commitment into legislation. This is an important and long-awaited step. We will look for the member of or the leader of the opposition's support for that part of the bill to come. And finally, it is crucial that the government acts fast to ensure the safety of our most vulnerable citizens and the frontline heroes. We are glad to finally see a government that is following Response. up on its words and doing something that Smokey Thomas, the president of OPSU. Mr. Speaker. I stop the clock. And I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Restart the clock. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks so much, uh, Speaker. My next question is to the Premier, but uh, I can tell you we uh, wait with anticipation the details of this government's plan. Let's hope it takes the profits out of long-term care. My next question, however, is on the autism issue. Ontario families are still waiting desperately for autism services for their kids in this province. The throne speech didn't even deign to mention helping children and families uh, with autism. The wait list for help continues to grow, and it has now reached over 40,000 children waiting for services. Why didn't the Premier even mention autism in the throne speech, and why are so many families still desperately waiting for services for their children? The member for um, Ottawa, Nepean. Ottawa West Nepean, parliamentary assistant. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Leader of the Official Opposition for that question. Of course, our government is extremely proud that we took action to double the Ontario Autism Program's budget from $300 million to $600 million. And then on top of that, Speaker, our government has been working to implement a new Ontario Autism Program that was designed by folks from the autism community, people with autism themselves, clinicians, researchers, agency directors, all of them came together in our Ontario Autism Panel to provide recommendations on this new program that we are in the process of implementing. In the new program, Families will have access to an expanded set of core services, including ABA therapy, speech-language pathology, occupational therapy, and mental health services. This is the first time that families through the OAP will have access to this expanded list of services. I'm extremely proud of the work that our government is doing to reform this program, and I'll be pleased to speak further in the supplementary. Well, Speaker, the uh, families that have children with autism are certainly very, very concerned about this government's lack of action. The Premier continues to say no to helping them to ensure that their kids get the services they need. In fact, we all saw when a mom named Stacey Kennedy camped out at the Premier's office for six days. That's after four years of not getting services for her kids' needs. Stacey's words are this. The system is broken and it needs to change. The former child and youth advocate actually, finally, somebody came to help because the Premier didn't. He showed up to help and she was very grateful about that. And only after Erwin, Erwin Elman, the former child advocate, showed up to help Stacey did the Premier bother to even speak to her. But they didn't help her. She still is without help for her child. Moms Question. like Stacey deserve better, Speaker. When will the Premier ensure that parents don't have to camp out at his office to try to get some attention for their children? Again, the parliamentary assistant. 
Thank you, Speaker. And of course, our hearts go out to, uh, to Stacey Kennedy and, and her son, Sam. We want to make sure that all families with children with autism, like Stacey uh, and her son, Sam, are getting the support uh, that they need. And I know that the Premier, Minister Fullerton, and myself have all had a chance to speak to Stacey and speak about some of the reforms that are underway to the Ontario Autism Program. To expand a little bit further on this expansion of services, that is underway, Speaker. Families, as I mentioned in the uh, previous uh, uh, question, are uh, going to be able to access core services. But on top of that, Speaker, families are also going to have access to a number of other pillars through the new Ontario Autism Program. They'll have access to foundational family services, which we launched last year to help families support their child's learning and development at home. They're going to have access to early intervention services to help Response. young children access services at critical points in their development. And, Speaker, they're going to have access to urgent and complex services. Thank you. Thank you very much. The final supplementary. Speaker, families with children with autism need supports now, not sometime in the future. They've needed them for years and years and years. I've got to say, in the last campaign, this Premier promised families they'd never have to come to Queen's Park again. No, apparently now they have to go to his office exactly. to try to get some attention. Exactly. That is not acceptable, not Speaker. Enough. The problem keeps getting worse, and this government has made brutal cuts to autism. In March of 2019, in fact, the wait list was 20,000 people, Speaker, 20,000 children, children waiting for service. Now it's 40,000 plus children waiting for autism services in this province. Families are desperate. Moms are camping out at the Premier's office. Sorry. In Stacey's words, and I agree with her wholeheartedly, it is scandalous. Yeah. Why? Why, Speaker? Is it always no for families like Stacey's, for children with autism from this Premier, but it's always yes for his buddies? Again, Thank you so much, Speaker. And uh, of course, as, as a brother of a young man with autism, I know how important it is to make sure that we are delivering these services. My family has been fighting for these services for over 25 years. And that's why I'm incredibly proud to stand in this chamber with a government that doubled the Ontario autism budget to $600 million. Today, Speaker, three times Three times more children are receiving support than at any point under any previous government in this province. That means 37,000 children are now receiving support through existing behaviour plans, childhood budgets and interim one-time funding, including the children that are currently being moved in to the new Ontario Autism Program, a world-class program that will make Ontario a leader in autism services worldwide. Speaker, what? there is still work to be done. We are on our way. We've got a solid plan designed by the community for the community, and we're going to continue to implement that plan. Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. More than three years ago, your government ran on a promise to lower gas prices for people living across the province, including those living in the north. In my riding, the town of Espanola saw gas prices as high as 147.9 per litre this week. This was also the average price of gas in Sudbury, White River, 157.9, Manitowage, 153.9. Gas prices across the province are reaching a 10-year high, and in the north, we are still paying the highest price for gas in this province. What is the government doing to, for the people in living in Northern Ontario to end price gouging at the pumps? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member will know that one of the first actions that we took when we came into government was to uh, take away those extra taxes on the people of the province of Ontario that were causing gas prices to go up. And again, it was the opposition that said no. They said no. They wanted those gas prices to continue to go up. They wanted the people of the province of Ontario to continue to pay higher prices for gas, Mr. Speaker. We said that was wrong. We support, we support those industries, Mr. Speaker. We know how important it is 
that the oil and gas sector is to the economy of the province of Ontario, how important it is to the, the economy of the entire nation, Mr. Speaker. And that is why we support initiatives to expand uh, exploration. That is why we have explored options to uh, increase supply to the people of the province of Ontario. But on every single measure, it is the opposition that votes against it, that works against it, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work for the people of Northern Ontario. We will continue to work for those enterprises across this province that Spons? rely on this industry, Mr. Speaker, because it's good for Canada, it's good for Ontario, and it's good for jobs and economic growth. Order. The supplementary question. The Minister of Energy, winter is quickly approaching, and Northern families are facing higher prices for everything from home heating to gasoline to groceries. Not only are prices hitting highs in the north, they are rising across the province. Yesterday in Toronto, the average price of gas was 144.9 per litre, which is a record high for the GTA. This government has our bill, the Fairness in Petroleum Product Pricing Act, which would allow the Ontario Energy Board to regulate the retail and wholesale markup of petroleum products in Ontario. Families in Ontario literally cannot afford the price of more talk without action. While the minister commits, to, will the minister commit to working with the official opposition to pass Question. this legislation so that we can give a break to hard-working families across this province? And again, Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, you know what will help hard-working families across this province? What will work for hard-working families across this province is continuing to support a government that reduces their taxes, Mr. Speaker. One of the first things that we brought forward here in this place was to fight the carbon tax. We said at that time and continue to say today that a carbon tax would cost the people of the province of Ontario, would cost Canadians. At, on everything, whether they went shopping, whether they went to drop off their kids at soccer games, that that would cost people massive amounts of money, and we are seeing it every single day, the cost of a carbon tax to the people of the province of Ontario. You want to help the people of the province of Ontario. The NDP want to help. Stop saying no, Mr. Speaker. Stop saying yes to helping hard-working Ontarians. Help us fight a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. When we said it would cost Ontarians, we are now seeing the impact of those Spons. costs on every single thing that Ontarians do. So we will continue to fight that federal carbon tax. It is not the right approach for the people of the province of Ontario. And I ask the member to join us, not only for the North, but for all Ontarians. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question. Speaker. Member for Sarnia Lambton. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question here is to the Honourable Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Minister, in my writing, I hear firsthand about the challenges smaller employers face when it comes to keeping people safe and staying open throughout this pandemic. They've done an exceptional job throughout COVID-19. Will the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development please tell this House how we're supporting these businesses and helping them keep everyone safe? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to uh, my good friend, the, the great member from uh, Sarnia-Lampton, for that excellent question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, since the start of this pandemic, our government made a promise to keep all workers safe. Recently, we announced the hiring of 100 new health and safety inspectors, which brings the total to 507, which is the largest in provincial history. I should add that in no thanks to the opposition members who voted against this very important measure in the beginning of the pandemic. Mr. Speaker, they voted against inspectors to keep workers safe when Ontario workers needed them the most. Our government will always stand up for protecting the hardworking men and women of this province. We remain focused on keeping everyone safe. In fact, uh, since March of 2020, We've now completed more than 65,000 workplace inspections, issued over 80,000 orders, and stopped unsafe work more than 100 times. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that reassuring answer. Mr. Speaker, we've made huge pro progress by working collaboratively with labour leaders, business, and all levels of government. So I'm pleased to hear that this government is going to do even more to support the workers and businesses in Ontario. Small businesses have been doing the best they can through this pandemic. I can think of many owners across Sarnia-Lampton who have pulled all, all the stops 
to keep their workers and their customers safe. Can the Minister of Labour please tell us how his ministry is providing Main Street with the source, resources they need? Thank you. Mr. Labour. Well, thanks again to the uh, member from Sarnia-Lambton for that important question. I want to thank, on behalf of Premier Ford and our government, all employers, especially our shopkeepers and merchants, for stepping up during this incredibly difficult time to keep our economy going and preserving the dignity and livelihoods of the workers that you employ. I know many of these entrepreneurs don't have large HR departments like big corporations do. That's why I'm delighted to share that we've introduced a new free online tool to help employers build custom safety plans for their workplaces. This portal will help hundreds of small businesses with confidence that they're following the latest health and safety measures for their workers and customers. I encourage everyone to try out the tool for themselves at ontario.ca forward slash COVID safety. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London, Sancho. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Ontarians still have concerns about the statistical curiosities over in the PC caucus. Dr. Moore said that too many people are saying that they're exempt from vaccines. There's supposed to be only two reasons someone can get a medical exemption, and the exemptions are supposed to be few and far between. One in 100,000, not one in 35. We asked yesterday if the Premier would commit to reviewing those exemptions, but the only response we got was a shrug. It appears that people can get exemptions for anything, and no one is ever going to evaluate this. Isn't the Premier worried that people are going to take his silence as permission to break the rules? I ask the Premier to please give us a response. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think I, I answered this uh, clearly yesterday. Uh, uh, a medical exemption, obviously somebody who requires a medical exemption, they will approach their uh, medical professional uh, to give that exemption. I think the Chief Medical Officer of Health has made it clear what those uh, uh, exemptions are. I don't think it is for uh, uh, members of uh, provincial parliament to be deciding uh, if somebody should be getting a medical exemption or not. I trust that uh, the medical professionals uh, are the best suited to, to be doing that work. Thank you. Okay. Supplementary. Speaker, in Saskatchewan, Scott Moe fired one of his MLAs for not telling the truth about their vaccine status. Here, though, the Premier said it's fine for folks not to tell the truth. You just need to have an exemption for it. As MPPs, we're supposed to provide leadership. We're supposed to set the tone. The people of Ontario look to us for guidance. But instead of showing leadership and saying no to people who think the rules don't apply to them, the Premier seems to be saying yes to special rules for PC MPPs. This is what happens when there's no province-wide system for validating exemptions. Why won't the Premier do the right thing and ensure that everyone across Ontario is playing by the same rules when it comes to vaccine requirements and exemptions? I, th I think we've been very clear. I know the Premier has, the Minister of Health has, and, and everybody on this side of the House has been very clear in that we uh, think the best way to fight this pandemic is to be able to get to, uh, uh, to get the vaccines in your arm. And we showed remarkable progress uh, on this, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, somewhat uh, close to 87 percent of Ontarians have received one dose, 82, uh, a little over 82 percent have received a, a, a second dose, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but there are those individuals who require a medical exemption. The, the Chief Medical Officer of, uh, of Health has advised what those exemptions should be, Mr. Speaker. I'm now just hearing for the first time that the NDP would seek to fire individuals who have, individ who have me valid medical exemptions from their jobs. That's not something that we are going to do, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, as we have done throughout this pandemic, to ensure that we have the best vaccinations rates uh, in the entire country, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we continue to support all of those people uh, who are impacted by the pandemic. But to be clear, we are not going to have any, a system in place where somebody with a medical exemption is fired from their job because the opposition is asked. Okay. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. And I do have to say, it's really hard for families to listen to the answer on the Ontario Autism Program, given the wait list has gone from 23,000 to almost 50,000. So, Speaker, last week the government announced Order. that COVID-19 vaccinations will become mandatory for everyone working in long-term care. And while that's welcome news, it comes months too late. We knew last spring we needed to do this to protect vulnerable residents, and yet, inexplicably, the government waited too long, and that allowed the disease to spread, outbreaks to happen, 
and people to die. For months now, Ontario's nurses, Ontario's doctors, Ontario's hospitals, Ontario's families have been asking to make vaccinations mandatory for all frontline healthcare workers in every setting. Why is it that this government has to be dragged screaming and kicking to do the right thing, to keep people safe from COVID-19? So, Speaker, through you, will the Premier do the right thing and make vaccines mandatory for frontline health care and education workers? Mr. Long-term care. Mr. Speaker, I, I do understand the member from Ottawa South's uh, interest in making things uh, look worse than they may be. But, Mr. Speaker, what we all know is, and through the great work of our frontline health care workers, our public health officials, and Ontarians everywhere, Ontario has some of the lowest infection rates per 100,000, not just in Canada, but across, across North America, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but nonetheless, back in July, um, I mean, even though uh, Ontario long-term care homes also had the highest vaccination rates for staff, we did start to monitor on a home-by-home -home basis. And in consultation with my colleagues, we decided that although vaccination rates were at 90 percent, there were some outliers. And, Mr. Speaker, that's why we made the choice, following the data, looking on a home-by-home -home basis to expand vaccinations and ensure that we put the safety of our long-term care residents at risk, or that are at risk at the top of the priorities. Mr. Speaker, we also, I'm happy to report with this opportunity, have 86 percent of eligible Spons? residents now with a booster dose in Ontario long-term care homes. Wow. So, Mr. Speaker, we consistently are taking the steps to protect long-term care. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I'm certainly not going to minimize outbreaks happening, people getting sick and people dying. And I don't think the minister should be doing that. And I understand that the Premier believes that making vaccinations mandatory is going to come at a political cost. I think he's wrong. And that's why this afternoon I'll be introducing legislation to make vaccination mandatory for all frontline workers in health care and education in all settings. And I'm doing that, Speaker, because I think families deserve to know that the person who's caring for their loved one in a hospital or at home, that that person's been vaccinated, or that the person who's helping their child in school that that person's been vaccinated too, or the child care worker who's in the child care center, that that person's been vaccinated. I think that that's all reasonable. It comes down to protecting those people who are most vulnerable to COVID-19, seniors and children under 11. That's the cost. Question. So, Speaker, through you, what will it take for this government to do the right thing and make vaccinations mandatory for all frontline workers in health care and education, I ask you again, Premier. Minister of Health. Our government's top priority from the beginning of this pandemic has been the health and safety of all Ontarians. And that's why we introduced the vaccination program that we have with some of the highest rates of vaccinated people in the world, not just in Canada. We're continuing with that. We're on our last mile strategy to get to 90 percent on both first and second doses. But the reality is that the people in our long-term care homes are the most vulnerable. They are the ones where we have seen breakouts happen, where we need to make sure we can protect them. That is why the Minister of Long-Term Care has created mandatory vaccine policy, to make sure those people are safe and to introduce the third and booster dose. But rest assured, should we see a similar situation unfolding, and we're watching this very carefully on a daily basis, we won't hesitate to introduce it elsewhere. Right now, though, the top priority is people in our long-term care homes. Those are the people that we need to protect. We saw that uh, with the third booster dose was recommended for them. They are receiving the booster dose, and we will continue to protect Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oakville, North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on Ontario workers and small businesses. For the past 18 months, business owners and workers have made tremendous sacrifices to keep our neighbours and communities safe. The people of Ontario have rallied together to get through this unprecedented crisis, and throughout, our government has been there for Ontarians. Can the minister please update this House on what steps our government is taking to support businesses and workers through this last mile of this pandemic? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade to respond. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you for 
Member, our government is making the necessary investments to support the people of Ontario during this crisis and into the future. Investments like the $51 billion in our COVID-19 action plan, which included $23.3 billion to protect the economy and the good-paying jobs in Ontario. Investments like the additional $50 million into the renewed Ontario Together Fund with a focus on supporting homegrown manufacturing and innovation to combat COVID-19. This will provide good uh, goods critical to the health, our safety and security of Ontarians beyond the pandemic. Our government is doing what it takes to protect the people of today and into the future. After 18 months of fighting this pandemic, we owe Response. the families, we owe the businesses the stability and certainly, and unlike the other parties, this is exactly what our government is delivering. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. We've come a long way since the early days of the pandemic, when the first cases of COVID-19 were identified here in Canada. Our government has never hesitated to do what was necessary to fight this pandemic, putting the health of the people of Ontario first. With more and more Ontarians stepping up to get vaccinated and as we turn our attention to the future, can the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade update the House on what our government is doing to ensure an economic recovery for individuals and families in my community of Oakville, North Burlington, and in every part of the province. Great Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, Speaker. Families can rest assured that our path to recovery will be fueled by economic growth rather than tax hikes or spending cuts. As we look beyond the pandemic, our government is working for the people of Ontario to ensure that we remain the economic engine of Canada. And we've already taken steps by reducing the cost of doing business in the province of Ontario by $7 billion each and every year. That includes lowering the WSI pre WSIB premiums by over $2.4 billion without reducing benefits. We allow same-year write-offs for equipment and that reduces the cost of business by a further billion dollars annually. We took action to fix the Liberals' hydro mess by lowering industrial and commercial hydro rates by 14 and 16 percent, respectively. And our plan is working. Large-scale auto investments Response. in places like Windsor, Oshawa, Oakville, and others are proof that we are unleashing Ontario. The next question, the member for Tewetna. Good morning, Speaker. I uh, have a question to the Premier. Vision is uh, key for development for children, as over 80 per cent of children's learning is based on vision. Dr. Sabri, a pediatric uh, ophthalmologist uh, at McMaster Children's Hospital, tells us more than a third of Indigenous children have farsightedness, more than three times higher than non-Indigenous children. Research also uh, shows that Indigenous children experience very high levels of uh, astigmatism and uncorrected fractive error. Uh, speaker, uh, right now, parents across Kiewitnung can't get their uh, children the eye care they, uh, they need because uh, this government won't negotiate a fair deal with the optometrists. Will this government fund the optometry Question. services that our kids need and deserve. Minister of Health. And thank you very much to the member for the question. You're absolutely right that children across the province require services of optometrists, as do many seniors. And that's why we were extremely disappointed that the optometrists have chosen to withhold publicly funded or OHIP funded uh, services for children and for seniors. This is something that is uh, very unfortunate because we are not withholding services. The government is not withholding these publicly funded services. It's simply that the optometrists have decided that they are not going to provide them. 
They, uh, we are ready, willing, and able to return to the mediation table to discuss the issues that optometrists have. There's no question that they were not fairly dealt with by the previous government, but we are ready to remedy those wrongs. We Response. are ready to go back to the table with them, to negotiate a fair deal, to listen to what they have to say, and we're asking for the optometrists to please come back to the table so we can do just that. Thank you. The supplementary question. Miigwech uh, to the minister for the response. Children need your help. We know that eye care is, is health care. And Kuwait uh, doctors have shared with me with their concerns about the high incidence of eye disease and extra care needed in the region. People in Kuwait are the, among the sickest in Canada. Elders and seniors right across the north need regular eye care exams because of the diseases they have. Because of COVID and now this, they have been waiting for two years now. Why does this government say no when it comes to ensuring everyone can access essential eye and vision care they need? Again, the Minister of Health. Well, in, our government is actually saying yes. We want to come back to the table. We recognize that uh, Indigenous children, children across Ontario, need access to eye care. They go back in school. Many of them may require glasses, for example. We also know that there are seniors that have cataract and other problems, other vision problems where they need to be served. So we, well, that's why we're asking the optometrist to please come back to the mediation table. You can't negotiate if there's only one party there. We are ready to go there. We have agreed with the mediator's requirements for considering uh, going back into mediation. We want to do that. We want to address the issues of the past, which we have with the payment of the $39 million. We want to go forward with starting with an 8.48% increase, Response. retroactive to April 1st, and we want to discuss the overhead issues that the optometrists wish to discuss. So we are ready, willing, and able to proceed. We're asking to the optometrists to please come back to the table. Thank you. The next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, avec Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We heard a speech from the throne this week. We saw that the situation is not good. There was a motion for liberation for the liberation university. But worse again, the government is not even ready to address a word in French. We understood that there were no federal intention. The government re continued to repeat the information, but they did not do a single thing for francophones in Ontario except attacking them. How can they tell us they are progressing when we cannot see actions? Thank you. The government has stated. Thank you for your question, but this is not true. We worked for the francophone, and you saw it in this house. You can look at the French flag in this house. There's also the Minister for the Fran uh, Francophone Affairs, the Minister for the Tourism. All of them did a lot of work for the Ontario, for the Ontarian population. Many ministers of the government made announcement. It is crucial for our government. Uh, we will continue to make the Francophone community a very important part of Ontario. We know that they are important for economic growth. They are important, uh, an important part of what makes this uh, province uh, great. Mr. Response. Uh, and unlike the previous government, who said a lot and did nothing, we will make, take uh, actions for that community. Mr. Speaker. The supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been three years and a half that the PC said they will uh, enact a law for francophone. They promised. However, it wasn't the case. We have been waiting for three years and a half. Mr. Pr Speaker, when will the government act? Before the presidential election? Before the election? Uh, 
We started from the get-go. We started with resources. There are matters and issues for Francophone, and they are the same as the one in other provinces. They want a strong economy, and we invested not only for Ontarians, but also for Francophones. The Minister of Francophone investment opportunity specifically for francophone uh, businesses, Mr. Speaker. When I look at the member's own writing, the Minister of Tourism made sure that $92,000 for, uh, for the Festival de la Cour de saint Albert, $48,700 to Group Convicts uh, Prescott and Prescott Russell, Mr. Speaker, $10,000 for the Optimist uh, Club, Mr. Speaker. So we're going to continue to make. It's not just about it's not just about Spons? putting the, uh, the francophone flag and recognizing it as, a, as an official symbol of the province of Ontario. That's important to the community, Mr. Speaker. Workers, it's yeah. about doing the right thing for Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Speaker, as we know, the tourism industry continues to be among the hardest hit sectors from the COVID-19 pandemic. Businesses that have contributed to their communities and regions for years have faced the toughest 18 months of their lives. Pre-pandemic, these tourism businesses were major contributors to the economy by creating jobs and bringing visitors to their regions. Many continue to fight to stay alive. Minister, through, uh, through you, Speaker, can the Minister please tell us how the government is working to ensure that these key tourism businesses are able to not only survive the pandemic, but recover and get back to being key economic drivers in our communities? Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Ottawa West Nepean for his very thoughtful question. He has been a strong champion for heritage, sport, tourism and culture industries in our city of Ottawa. The third largest sector in uh, Ottawa is uh, this sector, and uh, that's why we have made significant investments with Ottawa Tourism, investing over $6 million this summer in order for them to have business-to-business -business relationships around the world, assist them with marketing, and of course, making sure that they have the opportunity to hire a really incredible staff to get back to business. Of course, there is no uh, there is no doubt the hardest hit sectors come from the heritage sport tourism sectors because they are high touch, they are high volume, and have dealt the brunt of uh, and dealt with the brunt of the uh, public health restrictions. But we're getting back to business. We've invested a hundred million dollars in four different tiers with mass massive flexibility uh, for many different tourism attractions, including airlines and entertainment. Uh, we have invested over fifty million dollars in festivals and events across the province of Ontario and uh, we put out almost $100 million in small business grants. We're back in business, but we have a long road ahead, and so I'm excited that this member in our party is asking the critical questions about how we can best support those tourism operators across the Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Minister, uh, for that response. This funding is welcome support to key tourism businesses across Ontario, including in our hometown of Ottawa. The Minister and I had the chance to visit with many of these businesses in Ottawa this summer when we did a tour of the Byward Market, and I know that these businesses need support so they can once again take their place as an economic driver in their communities. However, we know that the Ontario tourism industry is built on a number of different sized tourism businesses. And so through you, Speaker, I'm wondering if the minister can tell us how the government has supported all tourism businesses suffering from the impacts of COVID-19. Minister? And, and, and the member is right. We had the opportunity to uh, tour and rediscover Ontario in our own hometown. I also had the opportunity to travel for the last 16 weeks across this magnificent province, looking at some of the most incredible assets that we have, whether it's natural or our art galleries or our museums or even some of the tourism attractions. I actually did tea truck tree-top trekking with the Attorney General, and that was quite frightening. Uh, one of the things I mentioned, as I said, we've invested $100 million into a tourism recovery fund for for-profit businesses, and just this week, every member of this legislature was able to announce in their own communities $46 million to community building fund applications and uh, successful recipients who are not for profit, who are just as critical to the well-being and the social well-being of this province, including the Art Gallery of Ottawa and, of course, the minister responsible
responsible for children and community and social services, Response. Uh, Diefenbunker, in her riding of Kanata Carlton. So I'm very excited, uh, Speaker, that we are working with our tourism and travel agents and, and uh, organizations across this province so that when we can come back, we come back much better. Thank you. The next question is the member for London West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government's failure to implement vaccine mandates in health care and education is hurting patients and students in my community. Diane Sims is a palliative care patient who relies on multiple home care visits each day. Because of her fragile condition, Diane's doctor recommended that only vaccinated workers come into her home, but her home care agency was unable to make this happen. Diane's husband is now forced to provide her care. Speaker, with vaccine mandates finally in long-term care homes, more unvaccinated PSWs will move to home care, putting more patients at risk. When will this government implement vaccine mandates in home and community care to protect vulnerable patients like Diane? Minister of Health. Very much to the uh, member for the question. This is a situation that we're analyzing on a daily basis. As you know, we have one of the most successful vaccination rates in, in the country and, and in the world. And we uh, have introduced some mandatory vaccination requirements for entering into certain settings. And as a result, uh, since the last mile strategy was announced on August 24th, approximately 365,700 first doses and approximately 525,900 second doses have been administered. So more and more Ontarians are stepping up to be vaccinated. But we have started with the long-term care homes because long-term care home residents have been uniquely and disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And since we are seeing some outbreaks, we are taking these steps right now with our most vulnerable Response. citizens in our long-term care homes. And I'll have more to say in this supplementary. Supplementary question. Speaker, it's not just patients, it's students too who are being hurt by an inconsistent patchwork of vaccination policies. The London Area Student Athletic Association, Thames Valley Regional Athletics, made vaccines mandatory for players, coaches and volunteers. But since school boards do not all have the same requirements, the TVRA announced that students would not be competing in high-level Western Ontario and provincial uh, competitions, stating that traveling to other locations in Ontario does not support safe regional play at this time. That was the right call, Speaker, but after all that student-athletes have been through, it is another blow. Why is this government refusing to listen to parents, school boards and education workers who are calling for Ontario-wide vaccine mandates in our schools? Mr. Health. We're listening to parents, educators, we're listening to experts in epidemiology. We are listening to the comments that are made by the people who are knowledgeable in these areas. They have recommended that we commence with a mandatory vaccination of, uh, of people working in uh, long-term care homes because the residents are so vulnerable. That's why we've also introduced the third or booster dose there. However, other groups and organizations have the ability to put in place additional policies and procedures based on local context, such as Sick Kids Hospital, which quickly implemented mandatory vaccination to protect children under 11 who are unable to be vaccinated. This is something that the local medical officers of health are reviewing very carefully in their local units as is our Chief Medical Officer of Health, and we are following their uh, requirements Response. and their recommendations. That is something that we will do to protect the health and well-being of all Ontarians going forward. The next member to ask a question, the member for Cambridge. In 2018, in full campaign mode, the Premier said, quote, there's billions of dollars being wasted. The party with the taxpayers' money is over. Once in power, three years later, the Premier has made sure the party is roaring more loudly than ever before. Just before we broke for summer recess, the government reintroduced the practice of using taxpayer money by the millions to fund the operations of political parties as they please. This was a policy the Premier had vowed to end. Why does the Premier think it's acceptable to use millions in taxpayer dollars to fund the operations of political parties at a time when many taxpayers haven't been able to go to work or are being fired from their jobs because of this government's policies. The government house leader. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, as the member will uh, will know, and uh, and was uh, very supportive. Uh, there's been a number of initiatives that this premier has brought forward that would allow for the democratization not only of this place that's uh, been highlighted in some of the measures I talked about yesterday, whether it was uh, a record number of private members' bills that have been passed, uh, whether it was the new take note debates. But when you talk about uh, uh, funding for political parties and when you talk about the supports. Uh, part of that, uh, those changes, Mr. Speaker, also uh, allow independent members now, for the first time ever in provincial history, to raise funds on their own so that they can fight campaigns equal to, uh, to political parties, Mr. Speaker. That was a very, very important change, something that the Chief uh, Electoral Officer uh, uh, asked and has been asking for uh, quite a long time. And you know, Mr. Speaker, look at us. Uh, we're always willing to, uh, as the member for Algoma Manitoulin often says, that we're always bridge builders over here. We bring people together, Mr. Speaker. And this, of course, with so many Order. independent Liberals, uh, Mr. Speaker, this was our chance Response? to build those bridges across the aisle and to give the independents the support they need to maybe, maybe once in a while, do a little bit better in elections than they have. Member for Cambridge, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, let's take a closer look. There are only two Ontario MPPs that are not receiving taxpayer money to fund their political operations and their re-election efforts. Me and the me member from Chatham-Kent Leamington. The governing Ontario PC party now receives $5.9 million annually from the taxpayer. The NDP, $5 million, and the Liberal Party, $2.8 million. Even the independent members from York Centre and Lanark Front at Kingston receive taxpayer funding for their re-election efforts. Taxpayers in large numbers are losing their jobs and haven't been able to work for over a year. But Ontario MPPs think it's okay to use millions in taxpayer dollars to fund their re-election efforts. Will the government immediately put an end to the wasteful spending of taxpayer money to fund the operations and re-election efforts of political parties and independent MPPs, yes or no? Government House Leader. I guess uh, that, that's where I'll disagree with the member. I don't think that uh, elections and campaigns and giving the members both independents and, uh, uh, and, uh, and those who still belong uh, to a party uh, the opportunity to approach the people uh, in their ridings across the province. I don't believe that to be a, a waste of time, Mr. Speaker. I actually think it's fundamental to the whole point of us you know, being here. That's why we campaign. That's why we work so hard. Uh, uh, I, I note that the measure did receive all party uh, all party support, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, I, I, uh, as she mentioned, uh, for the first time ever, we have independents able to uh, to raise funds and campaign, have electoral district uh, associations. That hasn't happened before. But as I say, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to not going to uh, to stop. Uh, I know all of us, we're going to continue to do all that we can to make this a better place, to make democracy work better, and if that means building bridges uh, across the Response. island, extending the hand of friendship to independents and, uh, and even to uh, other colleagues who used to be parties, we're going to continue to do that because it's in the best interest of the people of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The government let more than 25,000 Ontario small businesses go under in the first year of the pandemic before offering financial aid, but that aid that was finally offered excluded many small businesses. Kyle Sipkin's company, Incirc, is part of Ontario's $35 billion tourism industry and provides jugglers, stilt walkers and other interactive entertainment for festivals and special events. He says, I've fallen through the cracks of all Ontario and, and federal business support programs. I have not received any financial support, and my business is still excluded from the new tourism grants. We're just looking for fairness. The new tourism grants the government is offering will still exclude many businesses like Kyle's and provides funding on a competitive basis rather than for all of those which meet the criteria. What does this government have against small businesses like in CERC, and why are you creating a Hunger Games approach to deciding which of these businesses will receive the grants and survive and which you will let die? Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. I thank the member opposite for his question. But as I referenced with my response to the member from Ottawa West Nepean, we have just launched this week a $100 million tourism recovery program with the Minister responsible for small business and uh, economic development and trade. We launched another $100 million with the Minister of Finance as well. We just put $46 million out the door this week for not-for-profit organizations. We funded for the first time in Ontario's history the largest festival and events program in the history of this country with $50 million 
to over 350 uh, festivals and events, which contributed to a billion dollars in the economy. We are making targeted and strategic investments in the tourism, heritage, sport and culture industries in order to help these businesses not only survive, but thrive. I'm, I'm sorry for this one particular individual, but we are literally helping Response. millions of small businesses and hundreds of thousands of not-for-profit organizations in order to contribute to the economic success and viability of the heritage, sport, tourism and culture industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the, question, the answer doesn't answer about the competitive, uh, competitive nature of these grants, so that uh, not everybody that's Order. eligible will, will receive the grants. Businesses are also concerned about the federal wage and rent subsidies ending and that the provincial grants have not been renewed. Jeff Cruz, a bioconnect, a software company operating in Liberty Village, states the continuous starts and stops of the COVID heavily impacted BioConnect's recovery. Uh, we have allowed us, the, the grants have allowed us to receive or to maintain employment, but ending these programs does not line up with the reality of opening the economy. We need these programs to continue supporting Canadian-owned and operated businesses such as BioConnect. The recent Ontario Financial Advisory Report found that this government has received over $5 billion in federal funding to help small businesses, schools and health services to get through the pandemic. The last round of provincial COVID business funding grants closed Question. six months ago on April 7th. Will you be offering another round of grants to support small businesses such as Jeff's and why the long delay to offer more support? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you for the question. You know, I must begin by saying how disappointed we are that the member opposite and the parties chose to vote against providing the last $1.4 billion in additional support for small businesses. That budget included billions of dollars in supports that have helped families and businesses get through the pandemic. This includes an additional $50 million for the Ontario Together Fund I spoke of earlier to build up our domestic capacity. The, government, the, the opposition also did not support the $2.8 billion investment to connect homes, businesses, communities with broadband so that businesses can make digital transition. They didn't support our enhancements to the Regional Opportunities Response. Investment Tax Credit, which resulted in total tax support for businesses by $155 million dollars. Mr. Speaker, they supported none of these grants. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Health. Vaccinating children aged five to seven will be a major step on our way out of this pandemic. Pfizer will soon be seeking Health Canada approval for a pediatric vaccine. The government had the whole summer to plan for a safe return of our students to school, yet we are seeing a surge of cases in our public education system. Parents shouldn't have to worry that sending their kids to school will endanger the health of their families, and they certainly don't feel that the maximum has been done to keep everyone safe in the school. So my question to the minister is, what is the government plans for vaccinating children 5 to 7, 5 to 11, sorry? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I can assure the member, over the past many months, we've been working with the Minister and Ministry of Health, the Premier, and of course, public health agencies and Dr. Moore on a credible province-wide rollout that will uh, give access to the safe vaccine to all families who will want it. We have had incredible success with the next age bracket, uh, those children 12 to 17 in Ontario. In fact, because of the strong partnership with public health units and pediatric hospitals, we have one of the highest rates of immunization in Canada for young people. In fact, one of the highest rates of immunization for all uh, eligible uh, citizens in, in the province. So we're proud of that. And I think that track record could inform the next phase of this implementation. When the federal regulator approves it, we will stand ready to get it out, working with our school boards, using our schools and other government assets uh, to make it accessible for all families and encourage individuals to uh, take up the vaccine for their family. Thank you, Speaker. And the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituents are worried about the rise of COVID-19 outbreaks in our school. It's really happening. In fact, Morel Belanger, an elementary school in my riding, is just closed, along with three other schools in Ottawa. 
due to, due to the spread of COVID-19. And there are several other schools in my own writing that are experiencing outbreaks. Vaccination needs to be easily accessible as soon as it becomes available. The minister needs to work with the federal counterpart to ensure our kids get vaccinated as soon as the vaccine is available and needs to make that vaccine available in school. I know you've mentioned that, but I'd like to hear about that plan. My question is, are you speaking with Health Canada to plan you know, when the vaccine is going to be available question. and what is your plan to make it accessible as soon as possible? And the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I wrote to the federal ministers in March of this year uh, under the eventuality that Health Canada may approve a vaccine for children as young as five is noted, uh, asking them to procure sufficient supply and to have a plan to help get facts out to parents around the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine. What we have done in this province is launch, in partnership with the Minister of Health, 650 school-focused vaccine clinics, which has yielded one of the highest rates of immunization in Canada. To date, over 81% have a first dose for our kids 12 to 17, and roughly 73% have a second dose. That is a great success. We know there's more work to do. We're encouraging the safe vaccine on a voluntary basis to more families. We've also mandated for education staff that in the absence of being Response. vaccinated, which is our government's preference, you will be tested twice a week and launch an additional rapid antigen testing program just yesterday on a targeted basis to make sure our schools are safe, they remain open, and kids can learn in this province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Education, Haley Bateman and her family did everything right. They did their part, got vaccinated, observed all the COVID-19 guidelines. Just three days into school, Haley and her partner received a notice that there was a COVID-19 exposure in their child's classroom. A few days later, the entire family was ill. Haley's children are four, four, and five. Their symptoms were not mild and ranged from vomiting, fevers of 104, extreme fatigue, and hallucinations. Haley believes that her children were exposed through an unvaccinated staff member. In an email, Haley said that no one will take accountability for the policy failures that led to her children becoming so ill and, quote, in the end, only, left, only children are left with the consequences of the adults in charge. Will the minister step up, do the right thing, and finally implement a plan for safer schools that include smaller class sizes, improved Question. ventilation, and mandatory vaccinations for teachers and education workers? And to reply, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, you know, any individual that faces uh, COVID-19, regardless of their symptoms, we have um, we send them our very best in the recovery. We realize this has been a very difficult experience for so many individuals. The Chief Medical Officer of Health has confirmed as recently as yesterday that the protocol, the layered approach, has been very effective at keeping transmission out of schools. He noted that 87% of cases originate in the community settings, not within our school. Uh, he noted that our rapid antigen testing program, another layered approach brought in yesterday to high-risk communities, can help mitigate cases from entering the school. Every single staff member who is not vaccinated, which represents a minority of staff within our schools, is subjected to mandatory twice-a-week rapid testing. That is the prerequisite of entering our schools. We screen our kids and our staff before they enter our schools. We've enhanced ventilation Response. in every one of our schools, $600 million, 2,000 projects of improving mechanical ventilation, 70,000 HEPA units deployed. We'll continue to do whatever it takes to keep families, students, and staff safe in this province. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. The government house leader has informed me that he has a point of order. Did he wish to Thank you, Speaker. Just in accordance with Standing Order 59, I wish to outline the, uh, the status of business uh, on the return. And let me just wish uh, all colleagues uh, and all the, uh, the, the team members here uh, who work in the legislature uh, a very happy Thanksgiving. Uh, on, um, when we return on Monday, October 18th, we will be dealing with Opposition Day Number 1 uh, and then Bill 5, York Region Wastewater Act. On Tuesday, October 19th in the morning, we will deal with the speech from the throne in the afternoon. Uh, we will continue with uh, the speech from the throne uh, and uh, PMB ballot item number one, uh, standing in the name of the member for Hamilton Centre, and I'm told that that is to be determined uh, what that bill will be. Uh, on, Monday, on Wednesday, excuse me, October 20th in the morning, uh, we will continue, uh, both in the morning and the afternoon, we'll continue to debate on the uh, speech from the throne. Uh, 
PMB ballot item number two, standing in the name of the member for Ottawa South. Uh, I'm not sure which one it will be. I know he might have uh, more than more than one, but I'm sure he'll give us uh, notice. Uh, and uh, on Thursday, October 21st, uh, in the morning, we will uh, uh, begin debate on government notice of motion number three. We will continue that in the afternoon, and we will conclude uh, with uh, PMB ballot item number three, standing in the name of the member for Kitchener Centre. And of course, that one still is yet to be determined as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. There being no further business this morning. This house stands in recess until 1 p.m.